Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Mr. Jan Hoffman, Chief Trade Logistic Branch, Division on Technology and Logistics, UNTAP, to deliver the keynote address. Please welcome. Okay, I hope, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful good morning from, from um, Geneva. And I hope, I'm sorry, apologies, I had the system on. And you should now be seeing my screen. Could somebody kindly confirm that you see my presentation about right. setting the scene for yes. the digital future, long-term trends in my time trade, the past, the present, and the digital future. Um, so, the past, the present, the future. Let us actually start with the present. For the present, um, we at UNCTAD have generated quite detailed maritime country profiles of all our member states, 230 country profiles, including Thailand, of course. <clears throat> And uh, each profile includes basic data, information about market shares, about your trade, about your transport services, about the national fleet, the connectivity, and port performance. So with the organizers, we thought it would be good to share this as a starting where um, there are different aspects. There's the fleet, there's the port traffic, there's shipbuilding, there's seafarers. We thought the uh, best way would be look at market shares. And you can actually see the participation of Thailand in different aspects. For example, if you compare the share of Thailand in exports and imports and the economy, you can see that Thailand is actually a very open economy economy. You have a higher participation in exports and imports than in the economy of the world. That means there's a higher trade per economy than the world average. We can also see here that um, there are uh, more exports and imports explaining, showing the trade surplus. Um, as we can see, a 1.3% share in exports, 1.16% in imports, a trade surplus. If we move to the maritime sector as such, we have to acknowledge that Thailand is not a particularly strong player as a supplier of different maritime uh, um, shares. Um, it includes, uh, it has uh, actually the highest share in, in seafarers, um, not so much in fleet ownership or the nationally flagged fleet. There you can see a slightly higher share in the tonnage, the dead weight, than in the value. Uh, this is because the ships that are owned and flagged, the, the Thailand ships, they are um, bulk carriers, they are cargo ships, they're not so many, many very sophisticated ships in that fleet where you have a high market share is in seafarers. There are Thai nationals who work on board ships. And because the Thai fleet is not that big, it is clearly seen from here that there are Thai nationals working on foreign ships, foreign owned, foreign flagged. Where Thailand has a very high participation, it really shows how important maritime transport is for you, is in the port calls, where for most vessel types, you have a higher share than the, uh, than the trade, especially when you look at liquid bulk carriers, LPG carriers, and also container ships. There's one point worth highlighting here. You look at the share in container ship calls. It means how many container ships arrive in the ports of Thailand uh, as compared to the container port throughput. Um, that means that for each arrival of a container ship in ports of Thailand, 
they're slightly less goods loaded and unloaded than the world average. So I find it quite interesting to see how the just one picture, the market shares in different maritime aspects of the country, you can actually see quite a lot about a country's participation as a supplier, as a user, what type of cargo, whether it's a surplus, a deficit, um, more owner, more flag registration. So here we have the present. This is Thailand's participation in maritime businesses and port traffic. Highlighting, again, to summarize the, the relatively high share in seafarers, more officers than ratings, a higher share in officers than a rating. There are more ratings because there are globally more ratings, more normal seafarers and officers, but there's actually slightly higher share of the Thai officers. Also, again, the share in exports and the uh, importance of container ships and liquid bulk carriers. So this, we thought with the organizers, would be interesting to start this very important event to position Thailand in maritime global shipping. Now, let us also look at how we got there, some really fundamental long-term trends in ports and shipping. And as UNCTAD, we have more than 50 years now of hard data. I'm happy to share with you some really yeah, long-term fundamental trends. For example, here we look at the demand side, what type of cargo is globally transported? What is the seaborne trade? And you see the uh, how the dry cargo, which is the dry bulk, but also the containers, has significantly overtaken the liquid cargo. No? In 1970, there was more liquid cargo, more crude oil and other tanker than dry cargo. And now you have 71% dry cargo in world seaborne trade. Uh, that is what is being traded. Another, I find interesting picture, the big picture of who is trading? The seaborne trade, the share of the developing countries. And if you look at the 1970s, the developing countries were largely exporters of raw materials. That's high volume, but low value. There's a typo, it is low value. <laughs> um, as you can see, so the, you have the uh, lower share in goods unloaded and a higher share in goods loaded for the developing countries. Today, the de developing countries participate in globalized production. They are also importing large volumes of raw materials and inputs. It's a totally different geography of trade. And this old division of labor between North and South really is no longer valid. And when we now go to the supply, this is the mirror image of the demand. We start with a high share in the world fleet of oil tankers. And now I run the little video for you. We see how the container ships will be overtaking the other types in the general cargo and the bulk carriers, the dry bulk carriers will be overtaking quite significantly the um, oil supply side. If you look at where these ships are registered, here you can really see a lot of change. You see the, the open registries, how uh, Panama soon became the first open registry, the most important flag overtaking Liberia. You see how some countries really no longer uh, are relevant and other open registries are entering the market. You will see um, all of a sudden we see the Marshall Islands coming up. You see them now from the bottom. We could make it like a football or a horse race here. Marshall Islands are overtaking uh, even Liberia's second registry. But then at the very latest data, Liberia has again become number two. So there's in between Marshall Islands number two and Liberia. Um, and coming to the business, to the container, a bit more detail here, another long-term trend, which is very important for, for what we will discuss a little later, the, the freight rates, the costs, 
the modernization, the data, you see this process of consolidation, concentration. And what we see here are two sides of the same coin. You see on the one hand, the orange line, the maximum vessel size of ships has gone up. And the vessel size has gone up globally. This is the average, this here is the total, the largest vessel size. And, and then the blue line are the, the average number of companies that provide services from and to the average country. And this has gone down. Why has this gone down? Well, because the vessel size has actually gone up more than the demand. So mathematically, if you have bigger ships and more bigger ships, then also increased demand, something has to give. So you have companies that went bankrupt, like Hanjin, you have mergers, acquisitions. So the average number of companies providing service per country has gone up. And I have just for you done this chart uh, also for Thailand. Um, you see also the, the largest ships that call in Thai ports have significantly increased. Congratulations, one could say. You, you have been attractive. You have provided the infrastructure, the services, the, the digital services, the efficiency. And uh, the number of companies has also gone down, but not quite as much as the world average. So overall, I would say this is a positive development for the Thai container shipping. And this I can also show you in a, in a little video, which I like a lot uh, here. You see on a map, each dot is a port. And you can see here the one side of the coin, how the uh, bubbles for each port get bigger because that reflects the vessel size. So ships get bigger. You see the biggest are deployed, the, the big red dots, especially between Asia and Europe. And put differently, you can also here see the, the statistical distribution. Sorry, I'm an economist. I love these histograms. You can see how the number of ports that receive ever bigger ships to the right is increasing. Um, but still, there is um, a large number of ports, like the 50%, the median, 50% uh, of the container ports in the world, as you can see here, receive ships of only 1,800 TEU or smaller. Now, the other side of the coin is the number of companies. What you have seen earlier in the chart, now you see it in a little video, you see how the maximum number of companies go down and also the mean and the median go down. In fact, the median is stable, the 50% point, meaning there are half of the world ports, 50% of the ports in the world receive only three or fewer companies or services from and to the, comp uh, to the port, um, which is not so good news for the shippers, for the clients. And this definitely yeah, poses challenges to the shipper, to the client, to the importers and exporters also in Thailand. I have here an example from Buenos Aires. Um, I am standing here taking the photo on a crane of the terminal that is managed by Dubai Ports. And the client, the shipping line that calls in my terminal is Hamburg Süd. On the other side is the competition, the terminal managed by APM, which is a big group belonging to Maersk or the same group as Maersk. Now, as many of you may know, Maersk recently purchased the company Hamburg Süd. Now, what will the new mother or father tell his or her new daughter, the company Hamburg Süd? It will tell them and it did tell them, please no longer go to the terminal of Dubai ports, please come to my terminal. So there you have a combination of horizontal integration, horizontal concentration, and this vertical integration, which poses challenges to the port authorities, to the competition authorities, and to the clients, the importers and exporters. Now, let's move to the future. 
And it is all linked by data, by digital, by further information. And, and the future is really digital. But um, as, as agreed, discussed with the organizers, I will give a bit of a broader picture, including some very latest data on market developments and also link the, the future challenge to the largest challenge in maritime transport, which is decarbonization. Let us start with markets. And this is just updated the latest freight rates. It is really crazy. It's amazing how freight rates have increased and continue to increase. Uh, I've put seven selected rates here. And what is interesting here, but there are many things that are interesting, how it is volatile, how different markets go up a little bit differently. But I think particularly interesting how you have this global trend, uh, even if you have congestion in some port, or you have an ever given ship stuck in the Suez Canal, which is the little peak, the V on the right, when you see it started going down, then went up again, where you have this turning point. This was the moment the ever given was stuck. And it meant just by again having congestions and a lack of containers and ships at one point, one specific point in the world, freight rates went up again everywhere. So I see five reasons, and please don't shoot the messengers, but I thought I would share this with you. This is recent ongoing research. Five reasons why freight rates are likely to remain higher than over the previous long-term trend. First one is COVID, and I'm happy to share with you uh, here. There are some points that um, Dr. Chai Chan Choron Suk, chairman of your National Shippers Council, he shared in a webinar with us, and these were very valid points, the day-to-day -day challenges in times of COVID. And as you can see, again, there is one case in one country or a few cases in one port, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, again, lockdowns, congestion, ships detour, and, and it worsens the availability of ships and containers. But going a bit longer, I also see the long-term shipping cycle. What you see here is the order book. I should have written it. Yeah, it says at the bottom, the order book, beginning of year data. So you see how the order book used to be very high, 2008, 2009, 10. And then it went down. So that is part of the long-term shipping cycle. That means today's order book of ships is actually relatively low compared to the fleet. And it takes time to build ships. There have been a surge of new orders very recently, but it takes time to build those ships. So this long-term shipping cycle, I believe, will lead to higher freight rates in the medium term. Then, of course, there is this process of consolidation where carriers had really cutthroat competition. They were undercutting each other for many years. Many years they were losing money. And in their interest, they are now a bit stronger, consolidating, building alliances, and probably will not undercut each other as much as they did 10 years ago. Then there is decarbonization, which I will come back a bit later. But this has an impact also on freight rates. Uh, we just concluded an assessment of the impact of IMO short-term greenhouse gas reduction measures on states. <clears throat> and um, we estimated that these measures will, of course, lead to um, higher costs, yeah, you have to invest in new technologies, and also lower speeds, because that's the easiest way to reduce emissions at a point in time. The question is, will we have enough ships? Now, if you go 10% slower on average, you will need 10% more ships. But what if the ship owner is a bit uncertain about the new requirements, the new necessities in terms of uh, energy of what technologies will be needed. So he may actually be waiting a bit. So these are five reasons why I believe 
that freight rates are likely to remain higher. Let us move to the technology. How do we set today the rules for the future of maritime transport? And I like to say that technological progress will never be as slow as today. Is it slow? No, it is not slow. It is fast. But it will be even faster. Um, it's exponential. If you think back of um, think of blockchain, Internet of Things, AIS, satellite data, artificial intelligence, drones, and so on and so forth, it's really exponentially growing. So who leads the IT reforms in your company? The information and technology reforms in your company? Is it the CEO, the chief technical officer, or COVID-19? Well, we actually found in our work in Anktat, there's a lot of push, a lot of interest from port authorities, maritime authorities, customs officers, transport providers, confronted with COVID-19, where you need to reduce physical contact. You, you need to rely on digital solutions. So there's a big push towards digitalization thanks to COVID-19. And the key challenge is that we now have to lock in the progress made during lockdown. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we already at Anktar put out a 10-point action plan, uh, which goes along the supply chain from the ship to the port, leaving the port, crossing the country, transit country. Um, and practically all these solutions have to do with digital. And I will not go through all these things, which are relatively straightforward, but want to highlight one important message. And some of you may have seen, when you talk about trade facilitation, um, the picture of a balance, like a trade-off, where people say, oh, I cannot facilitate trade because I need to control. The concrete measures proposed in the policy brief, the concrete measures in the WTO trade facilitation agreement, in CFACT, in World Customer Organization, they help to facilitate transport and protect the population from COVID-19. Specific solutions from risk management to pre-arrival processing to more transparency to um, cooperation between agencies to digital. Of course, all this makes it easier for both sides, for the import and exporter, but also for the customs officer, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Agriculture, the police, anybody who needs to control, they will actually find that their work is facilitated. So please do not believe colleagues of mine who show you a balance. Tell them Jan Hoffmann had the same picture, but he had a big red line through the balance. It's the wrong picture. So again, how will we set the rules for the future of maritime transport? And as the negotiation, the ratification of conventions and, and national instruments, it takes time, we need to commit to whatever is the best future technological solution. The World Trade Organization, TFA, Trade Station Agreement, it, it's something we are very supportive of. We, we UNCTAD has helped with a lot of capacity building advice, and, and today we help with the implementation. But there are some parts in there which I think are already outdated. No? In the future, the concept of copies versus originals, as per Article 10.2 of the TFA, the Trade Station Agreement, will become obsolete as processes focus on data rather than documents. This is a key point here of this presentation also, that when we look at digitalization, we have to change our mindset. Said. It's about data. It's not about papers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there we have a dynamic dimension in the WTO trade station agreement. So here you have somebody in Geneva standing in front of you on Zoom who says, I am a fan of Article 10.1, my favorite article. I love Article 10.1. In the long term, this Article 10.1 will gain in importance 
as it does not prescribe any specific technological solution. All the other articles, there are 12 substantive articles in the agreement with about 37 specific measures. I have a web page, I have um, pre arrival processing, and so on and so forth. But Article 10.1 will still be relevant in 100 years from now, because it says you must progressively, progressively, continuously improve. The various provisions will become antiquated or obsolete, and we will just want to minimize the incidence and complexity of import, export, transit formalities. Continuously review requirements. Keep reducing the time and cost of compliance, and always choose the least trade restrictive measure. So this, for me, if we perspective from Geneva, this Article 10.1 is very important when it comes to digital solutions, because this is where we will head in maritime, in ports, in customs, land transport, cross-border. Um, this is the one article which requires continuously measuring, reviewing, and improving trade procedures for maritime transport. Let me move to the last and I think really the biggest challenge for the shipping sector over the next decades, which is decarbonization. And this is being helped, of course. It also depends on digitalization, on the use of new technologies. So if you th the, the IMO is leading this progress, this process and, and the progress, the International Maritime Organization, um, you know that initially the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, it had not included maritime and air transport because it was said you cannot really assign, among other reasons, but it was said you cannot really assign the emissions from ships and aeroplanes to the countries. And we have shown that this is actually wrong. I mean, not only us, others have shown as well. We are working with different partners. Marine Benchmark, for example, has for us, for the review of maritime transport, produced this chart, which shows in the upper part, the, the lines, they show the growth of the world fleet indexed. And the dotted lines show the lower growth of the emissions. So emissions are not growing as fast, which is one could say is good news. And this is what we are aiming at, like less growth of emissions as compared to the fleet. The problem is it is still going up and it has to go down. Um, so it's not quite the theme of this um, presentation, but there are of course a lot of discussions ways to reduce this. What I want to highlight here is again linking to data, digitalization, availability of information. It is possible today to track who is emitting how much thanks to data, to satellites, to digital information. And you can see, for example, that obviously those countries that register more ships, the averages, then you have some other countries who have higher emissions. This is not that these countries are bad or have all the ships, not necessarily, but it's also the type of ship. Like the ships that fly the flag of Denmark or Germany, they're often container ships. In container ships, they tend to go faster and they have more emissions per ship in this chart. So this is, um, yeah, I think an important concluding Part, uh, I, I just want to highlight uh, that when we talk about assigning the costs and making the polluter pay and say we have to charge for the costs of emitting the CO, the price of CO2, already today others are paying. It is not that at the moment it's free. Already today, people in Bangladesh are paying because they are flooded, or in St. Lucia because the hurricane destroyed their island or in Mali because the crops have dried out, or even here in Switzerland where the, the ski resorts have no snow. We must make sure that those who produce the emissions are the ones who pay. 
not all the others. And for this, with today's technology, with today's data and satellite and digital information, this is possible. So uh, I've shared with you some information about the past. Um, I have started actually with your, where is Thailand in the position, not so much a supplier, but more a user of maritime transport services. And then we went through markets. Um, don't shoot the messenger. It looks like the freight rates will be higher in the future than over the last decade. I discussed with you quite a lot on the concept, the technology, the, the need to prepare today for an ever-changing, evolving technology. And I shared some challenging data for you that uh, emissions from shipping have still been going up and they need to go down. For this, we need to assign, we need data, we need digital to make sure that we find out who is actually emitting, who is polluting, and then charge for these costs that are caused by the emissions. Thank you very much. So um, thank you very much, Mr. Jan Hoffman, Chief Trade Logistics Times from Antat, which is very insightful, very amazing and interesting presentation and your viewpoint that you have shared with us, especially for the future. So that's why, um, of course, we have a question that we'd like to ask you in case that if maritime transport costs increase in the longer term, what will this mean for the globalization trade, possibly Thailand participation? Yeah, interesting question. Um, you see, over the last decades, the long-term trend has been lower transport costs. Um, we have data for the United States, for example, where still in the 1980s, the expenditure on inventory holding in logistics was more than on transport. Today, within the United States, there's twice as much expenditure on transport than on inventory holding. And this long-term trend is not because transport is more expensive, but on the contrary, because transport has been cheaper and cheaper, we buy more of it. And this has an impact on globalized trade, globalized production. 50 years ago, when you bought a car made in Japan, you would pay so and so much for the transport of that car from Japan to Lamchaba or to Rotterdam. Today, this transport, except for the recent current peak, but the long-term trend was it has been, it had been going down. And still, you would actually pay more for transport when you buy your car made in Japan than in the past. Why is that? Because in the past, you would only pay for the transport of the car from Japan to Netherlands, for example. But today, you also pay for the transport of the tires from Korea to Japan, of the chips made in Bangkok, perhaps, from Thailand to Japan, of all types of inputs from all over the world that are then assembled along the supply chain. So in the past, the reduction of transport costs led to more transport. And because we had more transport, we had economies of scale, actually transport got cheaper and cheaper. Now, if of course it is true that these costs will now go up or remain at a higher long-term level for the next decade or two, then of course these supply chains can be expected to become shorter meaning a little less will be purchased from far away. Um, uh, one, I mean, as you asked the question, uh, I'm actually, uh, I like photography, and I have a Nikon. And I remember one occasion where all of a sudden Nikon could no longer produce cameras because of flooding in Bangkok, because the one factory of certain components was in Bangkok and it was flooded. You will remember the situation. Um, so that showed the dependency of um, too specialized supply. 
So what we observe is more a diversification also. We cannot rely only on very few suppliers. We need to diversify. We may need to shorten. Uh, and we may need, we, we will in the end, certain things not purchase that much from far away anymore. One more thing on that question. Uh, just recently with these high freight rates, we looked at which products will actually be affected more than others. And that is something you may want to do for Thailand, where for which products these high transport costs are more relevant than for others. So there are some products like high value clothes or electronic gadgets, where before the freight rate increase, the freight rate was 0.4% of the price in the shop. And now it has gone up to maybe 2% of the price. So that doesn't really make a difference. We will not buy fewer iPhones or fewer high brand clothes than before. But for other products, for example, high volume, low value furniture, the assembled furniture is the example where the currently high freight rates, current really very high level freight rates, for some furniture is as much as the value of the furniture in, in high street, in, in the shop, the average like 75%. And it was just maybe 10, 15% before. So, so there are some products that will no longer be able to be traded internationally thanks to those high freight rates. Sorry for the long answer. I think it was a good question and here was my attempt of an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. And I think this is very beneficial to all the audience who in the logistic trade and business here in Thailand and of course globally. So thank you very much for Mr. Jan Hoffman, um, Chief Trade Logistics Manager at Antat. And please take care of your health as well. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you and all the best for this fascinating event.